clear. Is um, it like a camera? No, it's just um, it's just a me, oh. me cheap Lenovo laptop. Right. Yeah. That's a good camera. I've got good skin. Right. That's what it is, Rob. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> <clears throat> You're looking a bit different, man. You've had a haircut and uh, and a bit of a trim up. And uh, you're also drinking three pints of water. <laughs> well, actually, I'm drinking this from a big uh, glass because I was in Lidl the other day. And um, they had this, um, they got an offer on where if you buy a big glass, then you get a, a like a two pint can that goes in it as well. It's like a gift set. Oh, right, nice. Four night, four ninety nine, And I just thought, oh, I'll get, get that. And, uh, well, it's good because I, I always... Um, try to stay hydrated but the other day i was i just i've been pretty bored in lockdown and i just thought i wonder how much water i could drink in the in the <laughs> sitting you know so i just started drinking <laughs> loads of water it was weird but i thought and then and then my head just and then I, I was drinking all this water i drank about like four pints in well, two of these, so that is four pints, and um, yeah. and then I start googling: can is it bad for you to drink too much water? And it is because yeah, uh, you can directly drown, can't you? Yeah, you can drown yourself. Yeah, so I was thinking like yeah, it wouldn't be a bad way to go just drinking too much water. Yeah, um, but the it gets rid of all your salts and stuff like that. Mm. So. It's like, and then, uh, yeah, so yeah, that, I've got a big, big thing of water, but uh, and I got a haircut because at the start of lockdown, I had quite long hair. And um, well, look, should we, should just, we record we, this? Should we start chatting? Yeah, should we start the podcast? Oh, yeah, we can, we can, we can I thought that it. was recording, I wasn't just and trying to be is, funny for no reason, uh, <laughs> 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 right? I'm gonna press record on my little recorder. Oh, here. god, I'm not gonna be able to recreate that gold. <laughs> Oh, well, look, welcome um, to Off The Beaten Track podcast, um, and sitting opposite me today is Rob Orton. Hello. Hello, Stu. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good, mate. Um, we've just been discussing, um, before I've pressed record on, on here, um, that the size of the glass that Rob's drinking his water from probably holds about three three pints, you reckon, or two? I think two. Yeah. Two, yeah. yeah. P- if people want to picture it, it's kind of got... It's made of glass and it's got the circular circles on the side of it. You kind of get them at um, the big German beer festivals and things like yeah. that. But I got it from Lidl and uh, yeah, end of story. So uh, aside from um, what we touched on before we press record, which is um, you seeing how much water you can drink in a day. Um, how, <laughs> how, <laughs> how's lockdown been, mate? It's it's been all right actually i mean i mean uh whenever whenever people start talking about that i feel like you've got to check yourself and make sure you say i'm in a lucky position um and um it's been okay for me i'm not cooped up in a small high-rise flat with like kids everywhere um we don't have a garden but we live close to victoria park so we could go there and um well i mean it was it it's difficult because i struggle when ch- plans get changed anyway um i don't know if that's because I, i'm undiagnosed but i predict i'm on i think everyone's on the spectrum to some extent and Definitely. um when when things get moved around I, st- I, I i struggle with it and i get a bit angry and um so like the the weekend after lockdown was introduced, I was meant to be going to Australia for the first time, doing a month at the comedy festival. And I've been psyching myself up for that for ages because I get quite nervous on planes and stuff. And um, and then uh, all that went and I was meant to be doing like my biggest tour, I'm meant to do like 75 dates. I'd done 16 and then the rest were postponed or whatever. So I th- think about that and then the thing with all the um, worldwide epide- pandemic or epidemic. What is it? Pandemic or epidemic? Uh, bit of both, isn't it? We go with pandemic, though. But all that, and I just remember getting in the bath on the first day 
of uh, lockdown after that big first news com press conference and just being like, oh God, there were so many different things coming in all different directions. And then it kind of leveled out and I got all right. And, um, and um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of writing, which I love doing and just trying to do that. And that puts me, I think it's uh, made everyone take a, certainly made me realize that the only way that I can get through it is by testing myself and just get put, going to work really. And then that, make, that steadies me out. How about you? I mean, just to clarify, drinking 15 pints of water is not work, Rob. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no. But, you know, I've probably, I got a, probably got a uh, unrecorded joke out of it. <laughs> I've, 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 been, um, I've been okay, mate. Um, I mean, we, we was chatting before lockdown about um, uh, meeting up in East London to record this face-to-face, -face, which is... Um, which is much, you know, obviously I prefer to sit in a room with someone and, and, and record these podcasts. But I think what I have learned, um, not just for podcasting, but in, in general that, you know, I, I do work a lot. Um, and I've realised now that through, because I've never really used Zoom or anything like this before. I've definitely realised now that I could probably work a little bit smarter and not have to constantly be chasing around town and, 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 you know, just to have a, a 15 minute meeting with someone, I, I, you know, hopefully I can come out of that and be able to spend a bit more time at, at home. I mean, not initially. I want to get out of home as soon as I can. It's been too long. I'm, I, I'm missing people massively. I like I like being around people. And uh, and that's the only thing I've struggled with, really. I, I, I run a I run a nightclub um, uh, in, in Essex and, uh, and, I, and I really miss people. I just miss standing on the door. Of the club and chatting to to to, to people and, and chatting music with people and 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 yeah and, and and just just that that kind of human touch you know being able to see someone and be able to shake the hand give them a hug and and, and stuff like that i miss that but apart from that i think just started to adjust a little bit but you know i don't know i don't have any idea what the fucking hell our government's going on about um but i do see that there is definitely a, you know a glimmer of light at the end of the tunnel here somewhere and it seems that you know it seems to be going the right way so i'm i'm, I'm hopeful that it's uh it's going to be uh back to a, a new normality um quite soon that's what i'm looking yeah. forward to yeah well it's uh, yeah when all my stuff went out the window i, thought, I kind of realized that it is people that it my life all our lives are built around it's just people yeah that's it and then how, how much we need each other and um, that's all we've got. And I love Joe Strummer and the way that he talks about people and um, th that they are everything and without them we're nothing. And it's just um, to be even sometimes when, because I spend quite a lot of time in isolation anyway, we're doing the job that I do, if you can call it a job, traveling around doing gigs and being on trains a lot. And um, just that sometimes, you know, you, I go for a go have a day and like maybe speak to four different people on the phone. And by the end of the fourth phone call, I'm like, ah, oh, right, I, f I feel connected now. Yeah. And um, uh, it's that, it is that thing about connection. And that's one of the uh, most difficult and challenging things I find about standing up on stage is that um, when you when you're talking a lot and that it, there's no connection there you're like oh right i must i'm throwing these words out in a way that aren't being caught and you're like right uh, i need to change i need to do this and it's like when you go to a party and you start talking to someone and uh then they like all right yeah see you later and then you're standing there you're like okay not that i've been to a party like that for about 10 years but i remember them yeah well you mentioned strummer so uh should we chat? Should we chat some tunes? Yeah. Have you have you got your songs in front of you? Do you know which ones you've uh, you've gone for? Yeah. 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 Wicked. Okay. Rob, track one, please. The song with the greatest ever intro. Uh, well, I chose the streets turn the page, and I'm not saying is it, is it one of the things that I learned when I was growing up is that it's you cause a lot less conflict if you say 
this is my favorite instead of oh that's the best you know yeah. so when you said that's the best it, or like choose the best one i was like ah uh, okay well i'll just i'll just say my favorite one one of yeah. many but this is the one that it when it comes on it um never fails to ignite me you know i'm like oh yes i'm i'm looking it really makes me excited for what's to come and i think maybe that's a good sign of a decent intro and um i just remember i think the thing is with this track the turn the page track is that it was at the start of the album as well and it was a foot so when this song came on and it was the first thing that i'd ever heard this intro was the first thing i'd ever heard from mike skinner and yeah. then i didn't know what was to come and then what came after it on all of original pirate material it was just my favorite album for ages and it's still one of my favorite albums and um i just love it i love the way that as he says in the track here the strings rising and it's really um there's a lot of drama in it and i love how the drum like the beat comes into it and then and then I didn't know, I didn't know what the words were going to sound like. And then the words sound like that. And you're like, Oh, oh wow. Come on. Yeah. Let, let's see. Let's see what this is. And uh, I've never heard anything like it before, really. And I remember it was in my mate's car and uh, yeah. Fantastic. Love it. And I think it's sometimes overlooked uh, how different the street sounded from, from anything else. Certainly when it come out at that point, there was, there was nothing that sounded like the streets. It was, uh, and, it, and it was very strange that for something that he's fundamentally, I, I guess, drenched in, 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 in dance music to a degree, um, it was completely embraced and grew in the, in the indie scene, really. And, and it, I, I just think it seemed to just, you know, transcend genres. And, uh, and, and yeah, and it just, he, he was completely unlike any other front man of a, of a band, or if you want to call it a band, I guess it is now, but I guess at the time, it, you know, what, what, I think it was just Mike Skinner and, and, and the stuff that he was putting together. But yeah, I just think that they, they kind of get overlooked sometimes and uh, for, for just the amount of impact that they had. Yeah, definitely, yeah. I, I, I think that um, that album in particular and that track was just... Um, I think a lot of albums on the first, the first track on a lot of like, when you start thinking about girls and boys on Park Life, and uh, I was listening. It was either that the Streets one or the Shining by Badly Drawn Boy on Our Bewildered Beast. I love that, just the yeah. strings on it, and then the guitar coming in or um, into my arms on. The Boatman's Call by Nick Cave, all that stuff. It's like I mean, the start. It sets the tone for the for the albums, you know. I think uh, I think into your arms, um, into into your into my arms, into yeah. my arms. Yeah. Um, I think that I noticed. I actually played that on Sunday on, on, on a radio show, and the vocal comes in really quick on that. It normally there's sort of like the four bars, and it comes in, but I think that literally comes in really quickly, and that. Just that gentle piano, you, you know, really does introduce you to like, right, you're going to get something that's going to tear your art from your body in a minute. And, and, and that track definitely does that. And, and it is, it's, it's, it's a real sort of sets the, the, the tone for, for the album as well, which is an absolute incredible piece of work. Well, yeah, the, I mean, the both, both absolute wordsmiths, aren't they? And I, I feel like the, I'd like, the way Mike's going to use his words, which is a very obvious thing to say, but I think the thing with Nick Cave is that he's just embodiment of um, every time I watch him, um, whether it's on YouTube or in li live, 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 you know, it's just the way that he gives just. 100% of everything that he's got to give to that performance and it just makes me want to try harder with my own performances and like if you can even though what I'm doing is like a, a kind of deadpan spoken word slash comedy thing about sleeping or talking or time it's like 
if you do it with conviction, then for me, that, that, that's one of the bars that I want to try to get to at some point. It's like to be, I mean, there's a video of Nick Cave at Glastonbury when he's doing Staggerly. Oh, mate. What? I've seen that with the girl where she, she gets ah. on the shoulders. What is that? She's called like the angel in the white dress or something. And he just he's standing. I mean, the way that Nick Cave presents himself on stage, whoever is responsible for lighting his shows, they light him like he's the devil. Like he's so angular and his clothes and suits are cut so well. The shadows that, that, that come off of Nick Cave are amazing. Yet he can still go at three o'clock in the afternoon at, into that crowd and stand there being held aloft, yet still look angular, sinister, just commanding, and whilst literally breaking hearts while he's just singing to that girl, like the one of the most fucking sinister records in his in his catalogue. It's yeah. uh, incredible, isn't it? Yeah, man. It's, uh, I think I've seen him a few times, and just him and Warren Ellis especially, I think, was... Uh, just that combo is just un- unreal, and like seeing seeing him and how much he gives it on the violin is, uh, and all those instruments. It's just uh, it takes it to it's like it's gnarly as anything. And it's yeah. like people who are so into the craft and it's so creative, and it that is the side of life that I want to be in. You know, yeah. just making stuff and giving it everything, and just just trying to have an effect on people and having a positive effect on people and giving some, giving people somewhere to go. It's like you come to the show and then we're going to go here and we're going to go here and we're going to go here. I'm going to take you here. And it's like, I feel on the streets one on that. I think I feel like he did that. Um, And it's just, I remember the first time when I started listening to Rage Against the Machine for the first time when I'd never really listened to much um, music like that. And, you know, when you put something on and you don't really, you haven't really had much experience of it before, but it's like, you know, you, you immersing yourself in like a new pool or something. You're like, well, I'll give it a go, see if I like it. And um, yeah, I mean, that was, I remember I went to Leeds Festival and saw Rage Against Machine in 2000. And um, yeah, man, just all that stuff. I mean, you could, you know, talk about music. Well, we are going to talk about music, aren't we? We are talking about music. <laughs> <laughs> all right, then. Well, look, you, you're talking about the kind of, you know, it, it, we've, we've just spoke about Nick Cave and, and, and Rage and things like that. So it fits nicely with, with, with track two, which is the first song you remember hearing that had an emotional impact on you. Mm. Which is um, All Together Now by the Farm. And I'll, I will be honest and say that that is the only farm song I've, I don't know any other farm songs. You don't know Groovy um, Train? And maybe I have if it was on the radio. Yeah. And you're like, this is the farm. I'll say that, but I'm, I'm, I'm a hell of a lot older than you, so I'll probably just presume everybody's got the same recollection the, uh, as myself. The, and yeah, that, I just remember, I mean, the reason I picked this is because every time it comes on, it always takes me back to a specific place in my parents' house, which is the living room. And, um, our, you know, we had like a green carpet. And um, whenever that song comes on, I, th- I think about this action force figure that I had a little, about three inches high. And um, I was opening it, and for some reason, this song was on, I think probably was on the radio, and this action force figure. And you know when you get like a um, a toy when you're a little kid, and you've got all the different parts, and like you put the gun in his hand for the first time, and then like you start playing with it, and they were always quite special moments for me. Because, I mean, it, a toy was always a, a treat for me. I was never, I, I had enough toys, but I, I didn't have them coming out of my ears. Do you know what I mean? And or maybe maybe my parents would disagree with that, but um, it just felt like. And this this guy had like a um, you know, glasses and um, combat trousers, and and it was. And whenever I, it's such a specific memory of of the the farm being on. And I guess now when I when I hear that song, it makes me think about the 
like maybe like the safety of that situation of what, being what, there. What's that emotion then? What would that be? I guess comfort, maybe. Yeah. It, but did it make me feel comfortable at the time? I can't remember. Um, but I was trying to think of like my first musical memory, really. Um, but that that did it made me feel that, and uh, maybe I've answered that wrong. But I feel like that 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 was that was the one. <laughs> incidentally, <laughs> incidentally, I just want to. Uh, was you was you quite into Action Force? Yeah, yeah. Have you seen the crowdfunder book? No, what's that? <laughs> it's so weird that you've just mentioned actual. Last week, my friend come round, and uh, and some guy had set up a crowdfunder to um, publish a book on every single Action Force uh, vehicle and figure that oh, really? was available. And he bought the book and he come round with it, and uh, yeah, it's quite a good read. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, yeah, yeah. So but, wait, um, wait. Action Force was different to GI Joe, wasn't it? Sort of. I think there, there was, was like kind of, I mean, there's probably some toy enthusiasts screaming uh, at the speakers right now. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do believe there was some kind of sort of crossover at, at some point. Um, I'm not going to put my neck on the line on that one though, Rob. No. You you mentioned um, green carpets and, 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 and being at home mm -hmm. and, and the comfort of that. Was there, was there music on at home growing up? Yeah, I think my dad always um, loved loves uh, Led Zeppelin, and um, but now he's growing up. There the, was there was music, but I think now we've more because I've we've got access to the internet and things like that. My dad loves just looking at new new bands and things like that, and he's always sending yeah. me stuff and. Loves the flaming lips and um Oh that's a pretty cool dad. <laughs> yeah, that's dad just sending your flaming lips records. <laughs> well no, it's only I got him into them, to be honest. <laughs> but um growing up, no, there was, yeah, I mean, one of probably one of my earliest musical memories, it didn't really make me feel anything, but I remember it was when I was at my granny's house in Bridlington near just uh, it's on the coast in yorkshire and um she had a tape of uh it can't have been the white album it was some sort of beatles compilation maybe it was the blue blue best of on yeah. tape and and um she, she was playing obla di obla da and um i remember that and loving it and um but the, yeah there was i think there, there was there was music and it growing up i mean when we went on a holiday to one of the first holidays we went to menorca and i had um meat love hits out of hell and we just played that in the car all the time and i remember being in a hire car in menorca when it was about 10 or something listening to listening to that and um another time being by the pool and i think they had what's the story morning glory and we were playing it really loud and we you know like one of those times where you ask the uh, guy behind the bar if you can put a tape on his machine yeah and then turn it up and then probably the locals being like oh for god's sake what <laughs> um um, but it was good fun, you know, and I feel like there's always safety in music, isn't there? And I always yeah. feel that these, um, especially in times like we're going through at the moment, if you haven't listened to it for a bit and then you put something on, it's like, oh God, it's just amazing. It's the best. I always wanted, I'd love to have been a musician. I've got a guitar, I can play it well enough to please myself, but not anyone else. And, um, yeah. I get a lot from trying to play it and uh but I had a dream you know if I ever I'm in a position where someone would be like oh this must be like a dream come I don't really dream about performing but I had a dream when I was about 11 no I'm about 15 
and I was on stage with the Stereophonics at Glastonbury. <laughs> and um, it's so weird. I mean, I used to love the Stereophonics. And um, I mean, so that will be a dream come true if I ever get to play with them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Are you, uh, yeah, playing guitar, yeah? Yeah, probably. I mean, I've got a lot long way to go and I don't know if they're going to get to play Glastonbury again, so I've got to get my skates on. <laughs> okay, track three, Rob. The song that reminds you of your time at school. Oh, yeah, right. So, I mean, this is... as I'm trying to be true to the memories here, so this song, Gomez, is the cowboy song by Gomez, which was on the EP Abandoned Shopping Trolley Hotline. And um, it's a very short song. And um, we used to have a uh, tape player in the art block where, so this was sixth form actually, the school that I went to had a sixth form college attached to it, where it was all part of the same grounds or whatever. So um, we had a block that we could go in, we'd have other classes as well, but we had an art block where you could go and just kind of spend your lunch hour in there. We actually had somewhere to go and it was really good. And there was a all like paint spattered, um, tape deck in there and uh i would make compilation tapes and subject everyone else in the block to my compilations and uh sometimes i'd stay on for a bit and anyway i made one compilation and i like this gomez song so much that i put it on twice like back to back as as in made a compilation and recorded it once and then recorded it again so it just plays straight because it's only two minutes long yeah and um, I remember one time a girl was like, once is enough to just fast forward this now, please. And um, But it's great. I love Gomez. Big fan. So remind me of that, that EP. Was that, that, that was after the, the, the debut album, wasn't it? Yeah. And is, is that the one? Did it have a Beatles cover on that? Did it yeah, have it getting did, better did, on it? Yeah, it did have getting better on it, yeah. Yeah. Sung by Ben. Is it Ben Otterwell? It is, isn't it? Yeah. It was, and his solo stuff's great as well. well. I mean that. I mean when that that first album dropped again, like the uh, like we, we touched on with the streets, it was like nothing else sounded like that. This was coming out of kind of around the. It would have been around Britpop time. It would have been mid mid or ninety six, ninety seven. I think the first album. Yeah. And and I mean when you start looking at what was the record labels were signing and putting out. There was nothing else sounding like Tijuana Lady, I know. Oh, but, you know, what a record that is. Yeah, I know. Do you remember it when it came on um, Trigger Happy TV? Yeah. And um, I, I just loved that when it came on. And um, I saw them at V99. And oh, um, I was at that. Oh, were you? Yeah. Where, at Chelmsford? Yeah. Yeah, I was at the Staffordshire one. And um, is it, tell me, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, and it it was just, I, I remember um, I had such a fit. I'm I'm might come across as a bit of like a scaredy cat on this, but it was the first time I'd I'd never been to a gig before that. It was the first, um, and my friends were like, "Come on, let's go to V99." And it was I've got such a specific memory of the the ticket coming through the post and me looking at the. It's quite a big ticket, really. Yeah. It's about five inches by about three inches. And um, it's a V99 on it. And there was this massive crowd printed on the ticket. And the, I'd like the um, like hologram bit on it or whatever, like the shiny bit. And I would look at the crowd and I'd be like, I can't go to that. I can't <laughs> go to that. It's too big. It's going to be too big for me. I'm not, I'm not ready for it. And um, I remember on the night time leading up to that, about three months, I'd be like, on the night time, I'd be like, I'm not going, I'm not going, I'm not going. And then I'd go to bed and I'd be worrying about it all the time. And then I'd wake up in the morning and be like, of course you're going. What were you worrying about last night? Like the fear really comes into me on a night time a lot. I mean, I know that happens for a lot of people, mm -hmm. but that is a very, I remember that so vividly. And, um, and uh, there was a picture, like very small picture of the rubbish bins. Like I was really looking at this ticket very intently. And, um, and then we went and I was like, look, I've bought a padlock for the tent. Can we put this on it? And uh, my mates were like, no, we can't. And, uh, and then, I put, yeah, it was just mental. And then I remember on the Thursday night walking 
up to the stage and Suede were doing a sound check. And it was the first time when at a live gig when that, that bass, when you hear bass in a live setting, especially at a festival, mm. where it just like makes your ribcage shake. And uh, I just thought, oh God, this is going to be. And then, and then I think on the Saturday night, it was uh, Stereophonics. It was Stereophonics. It and was. It was, it was that. I remember they they started with um, uh, Hurry Up and Wait of Performance and Cocktails. And then um, we were like, oh, this is all right. Let's go to the front. And then we like barged our way to the front. And then they did uh, Bartender and the Thief and everything just went mental. And there was <laughs> like people with nosebleeds everywhere. And I was like, oh my God, it's just like I thought it would be. As And the worry was just on my nights of that. And then... Um, but that festival was, uh, I think that, that I remember watching Travis and um, that was the weekend that the Man Who album went to number one. I still listen to that. I mean, I'm not that much of a dweeb, but not so that, I mean, I, I do like it. I, I love that album. Driftwood, all them, right to reach you, Driftwood, all that. Turn was a tune. Yeah, big time. Did you enjoy school, Rob? Um... Yeah, I think I did. I think, I mean, it's weird. I was never really, I didn't really get into trouble very much. The best thing about it for me was um, the art and graphics classes. And it was the first thing that I um, zoned in on and was like, all oh, right, I feel like I can do this. And then I did it and I do miss, I do, I miss it. I miss the structure of it. Yeah. I feel like now I'm ready to learn and I'd love to have a science class for free. Just for that. I'm, I feel now, I feel like I'm ready to go to school. I'd love to, get, you know, get up, right, nine o'clock, maths, great. Let's see, let's test ourselves on maths. And, you know, we've been doing loads of these quizzes during lockdown it was like i used to really stress out about exams but just think of them as quizzes yeah right yeah absolutely. we got a quiz today well right. i think it's the gcse nah i've got some lemonade i'm all set <laughs> and um the it was uh, yeah i what was i gonna say don't know Couldn't what did you want to be that's cool what did i want to be mm. Mm, I don't know. I think it be quite. It became apparent quite quickly that I was going to have to do drawing or or something like that. I I never really had any ideas at school. Um, there was there, there was there was nothing like there was no wasn't particularly creative. I remember doing English and. Um, one of the best grades I got was you had to write a review of the Titanic film trailer, which is mad now yeah. thinking about it. Like, okay, what we're we gonna what, like if you're an English teacher, you're like I weren't expecting the word trailer on the end of that sentence. No, no, no. <laughs> you're like, okay, we're, so maybe she thought, okay, um, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get the kids to write a review of the film Titanic, but. Uh, it lasts for three hours and we don't want to watch in a film for three hours. So just get him to do the trailer. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What did I want to be? Probably. I mean, it, it, it made me um, want to do art A level and I did art foundation and then I did a uh, degree in graphic arts and then that's where the ideas um, were uh, encouraged and then I started having ideas and uh, it was all about the concept and um, that's what um, uh, made me start writing things down in notebooks really. And then after that, I um, thought, oh, what job wants someone who likes having ideas? And then I got into advertising after a lot of trial and error and sending out loads of strange books and things to 
started writing short stories and sending them off to advertising agencies saying, and then I remember one lady sent me an email back saying, why have you sent me these books of short stories? And I was like, well, can I have some work experience? Like, no, of course you can't. And um, I, yeah, and then I, I got lucky and um, my dad knew someone who, whose brother-in-law worked in advertising and uh then i got work, uh, i think a week work experience and then they said okay you can you can uh come in for another week and then i did a month and i think one of the things that actually swayed it like music helped me out here because there was a cd player and in that office and when i started after a week i said to the creative director can i put a cd on and uh, he said, yeah, and I don't, I, it used to be used a little bit, but then I just started putting loads of music on, I think. And uh, they were like, oh, people like having you around and music would have helped that, I think, because it just, you know, if you put some classical music on or something when everyone's working, it can really help, can't it? Mm, totally. Track four, Rob. The first song you bought from a record shop. Uh, yeah, so this is, this is the, again, to be true to the answer, it's um, An Alien for Christmas by Fountains of Wayne. And uh, I just, I heard it on the radio and instead of recording it, I bought it. And it was the first one I bought. It was like, went, in, went into York with my, friends on the bus and must have got it from HMV or Woolworths or something and just um, loved it, loved the storytelling of it, it made me laugh, it made me think about getting an alien for Christmas and owning an alien and I, I presume, I can't remember, I think it, it would have made me, all that stuff, I just, I, I think that Even then, I've pr probably looked at life to be a challenge yeah. and the escapism of stuff like this and the surrealness. And I just loved, uh, I still love laughing and, and, and um, escaping reality and uh, the... the this definitely did that for me at this end, that age. And I was looking at the, you know, I've got boxes of, sing not boxes, but I've got boxes of CDs and this is there and it's still in like the little uh, thin sleeve and love it. And he passed away, didn't he, the lead singer recently? But um, He did, he did. Um, I think he was one of the two, there's two that this was shared the vocals and he, he, he was one of them. And um, the, the, the first two albums by Fountains of Wayne, think are amazing it's just such a, a great band um do, do, do you know how they got signed no so um that, that they kind of um popped into the uh the, the the public domain by do you remember the um tom hanks film that thing you do mm. so that band uh yeah. that wrote all of them the songs is mm. the fountains of wine and uh and so all the tracks that were on that film were, were written by the Fountains of Wayne before they were the Fountains of Wayne. And oh, really? uh, yeah, they, they got all these songs. And then, they, yeah, off the back of that, they got a, they got a record deal and, uh, and put out Radiation Vibe and the rest was history. Brilliant. Um, for track five, mm. the song that soundtrack your year's clubbing. Mm. So that can be any clubbing. That can be in a you know, in a dirty, sweaty indie club that can be in Ibiza, that can be in London, in some dance venue, anything, whatever your, club, whatever your time was partying and dancing. Yeah. So I was thinking about that actually, because I thought, oh, is this like clubbing, clubbing? But the only clubbing that I've done has been indie clubbing. Yeah. And um, this was at university. Um, I went to the University of Northumbria in Newcastle and did a graphic design degree. And um, the track is 
Well, we always used to go to this club called Stone Love um, in Foundation that's quite near the quayside. And um, it was just fantastic. It was, and this song that is The People by The Music, um, on, this has got one of, when this song comes on in a club, it's got such a powerful intro. And uh, it would just be great. We would request it all the time. And um, when I started university, um, there was a few of us. There was like my mate Simon who lived downstairs and we knew each other from school. And then he was in one flat and then I was in another flat with some people I didn't know who were still some of my best friends now. And... Um, you know, we got talking on the first day and they they were like, oh, we've got uh, tickets to see this band. In, it was in Freshers Week and it, the band was the music and I'd got a ticket for it before and Simon had a ticket. And so there was like five of us who all went in uh, Freshers Week to see the music. And it was kind of a galvanizing of our friendship, really. I think that moment where they said, oh, yeah, we've got tickets for that. I'm like, oh, great, brilliant. Yeah. And I remember I'd, I'd been working in um, Safeways over the summer doing the night shift, um, trying to earn money to uh, go to university. And because it was on the night shift, I couldn't uh, spend any of the money. And I was getting, like, double time. and. Uh, this they always had one of the ends and the supermarket had cds on it and uh this cd came and it had such a colorful cover with all the circles and i didn't really know much about them but i knew that from the songs that had been released as singles as the album came out and just blew me away really and um this song the the people by the music was it was just I remember one time was in the nightclub and uh, we'd gone through a stage of taking magic mushrooms in our flat. I've only ever done it once. Never do it again. I never do any drugs, but my friend, you could buy them then. And it, it was um, in Shieldfield, there was this shop. It was selling Mexican truffles in these white, like almost like medical tubs like as, as you'll get vitamin tablets and we took them and I had a really really bad dark experience but one of my other mates decided to take them again and we'd all gone out and gone um we'd gone to foundation the nightclub and um before going to foundation we'd always go to this bar called Dobson's and in there you'd go in there and it was five treble vodka and coke or lime and lemonade or orange or whatever no it's, it's three treble vodka lime and lemonades for five pound five pound that get you in so, trouble yeah so you'd go there and then the night would pretty much be over but you'd still go to the club and uh, anyway my mate he'd stayed at home and had these magic mushrooms and then he came to the nightclub and we were all there absolutely raging and um, the the song, the people by the music came on, and um, this guy came on Magic Mushrooms, and we were all drunk. And then the the song came on, and I like through the all, I had two two drinks in my hand, and just, the people by the music came on, and I just threw them down and smashed them on the floor. And I was talking to him, and then he said that he just left after that because the contrast of him being on this strain. Anyway, bad story. Sorry about that. Well, it's weird that you mention the music because, uh, <laughs> well, it, I mean, I, if you're on mushrooms, the music was pretty psychedelic in places as well, wasn't it? It was a real, like, kind of crossover band as well. And to take it all the way back to the beginning where we said um, that um, the, the streets, you know, obviously before they were a band, uh, and obviously when the streets play live now, they are a band. And mm. Rob Harvey, the singer from the streets he's he's in the streets now isn't there sorry leasing and music yeah. he's now in the streets mm. um i mean his voice he's fucking off the scale good isn't it 
uh, incredible. Do you follow him? He's on Instagram. And yeah. he, he often sings just with his guitar. Sometimes does covers and and uh, and it's just remarkable. Yeah, I yeah. think that he, he's. I don't know. I wonder if he'll ever release a solo album or anything like that, or do stuff. I hope so because in the way that I had a I had a live DVD of the music live at a blank canvas in Leeds, and there were some interviews um, in between the tracks, and the way that he spoke about creativity and things like that. It's like, comes from such a true place. And um, yeah, I just, I'll, I'll always love that. And when sometimes when I go on, go on stage, uh, the, one of my favorite things about um, doing gigs is that you can choose the music that um, gets played as the audience are coming in or, or when there's an interval and you can put all your favorite songs on. And um, I'll often try and, well, I won't try. I will put one of the music songs on. They've got such a good song, "Rain Dance," that was um, that was a uh, B side. I, I love "Rain Dance" by the Music. That's a good one to put into Spotify. Oh, cracking matter. I don't know why they split up. I don't know what happened there because they got there's so much media attention as well. They they just blew up that band, and it all just seemed to go quiet. With with, I didn't see any explanation for it anywhere. No, they were massive in Japan, weren't they? Mm. And um, I saw them at Leeds Festival. And uh, I remember going, actually going the Stone Love thing. The, the thing with Stone Love is that they had, it was so well marketed. They had these flyers, flyers and it says your internet connection is unstable. All right, mm. isn't it? We still are good. I'm good. Yeah. Well, the way Stone Love was marketed was it was so good because they had black and white photographs, like classic black and white rock photographs. And then just like the transparent, like the outline of Stone Love. And then, so they were really collectible and everyone at uni used to collect these flyers. And if you would, you would try to seek out the people who were giving out the flyers for Stone Love because people would put them up on their wall and get the posters framed. And I had a huge collection of, of um, like really good rock for, you know, the one of um, Stevie Wonder where he's got his glasses on and a big yeah. headphones and like all these just brilliant ones and ones of like Manny and, and, um, and then I remember being at Leeds Festival and I had a Stone Love flyer of Elvis and um, I asked Robert Harvey to sign it. And he, I, I remember like they came to the um, barrier after the gig and I handed him the flyer. I was like, oh, what do you want me to do with this? I was like, I'll just sign it. And uh, yeah, good guy though. Yeah, yeah. He, he always comes across really, really nice. I've sort of had a few chats with him about coming on here and just can't seem to sort of get it locked down. But um, this was when he was away with the streets. So uh, yeah, I'm definitely going to re really chat to Rob because uh, I, I, I thought that the music were an incredible band. Track six. Rob, favourite song from an artist from your home county? Okay, so I chose, um, where is it? Hold on, I might have to do that again. So where will the, uh, which county are we talking about? Okay, hold on, we'll just have to cut for a bit here. That's like, um, I'll put it over. It's either, I want to say the title right. Is it Fat Children's Took My Life? No, it's yeah. just called Fat Children. Fat Children, yeah. Okay, so should we start that bit again? Yeah, cool. Uh, so, uh, um, Rob, track six, uh, favourite song from an artist from your home county. All right, so this was uh, Fat Children by Jarvis Cocker and is from Sheffield, so Yorkshire. And uh, I was going to choose something by Shed Seven, but I love York, this York's song. York's finest, mate, York's finest. Yeah, yeah big time. When <laughs> I, I grew up in a village called Barnby Moor, and uh, it was about 12 miles outside of York, and um, they had a football team, and this guy called Ben, who was um, friends with, Shed Seven um, wangled it so that Shed Seven became the shirts 
shirt sponsor for the football oh, team. Yes. So on the training top, so they all had shed and then seven. Wicked. On the back. So was, was Fibbers a, a hangout for you? Yeah, yeah. Fibbers, York, Fibbers, um, and the Barbican. Um, I saw Fun Living Criminals at the Barbican. That was one of my first ever um, gigs. And um, that was one at school where everyone was like, we're going to go and see Fun Living Criminals at the Barbican. And I just was like, what? Uh, yeah, up for it. And um, yeah, York Fibbers, it, it's... Um, I've seen some good bands there. I can't remember any at the moment, but it's still going. And I think that the thing is with York, it's like it's, it's like it's football team that it needs needs some investment in the. Maybe people listen to this might be like you don't know what you're talking about with York's live music scene, and I probably don't. But from a outsider's point of view, looking in, it's like needs some needs some big, not big, but just decent venues. You know, they probably are. And I'm, I apologise for my lack of knowledge on York's music scene, but um, so was Jarvis, Jarvis and Pulp. I mean, were, were Pulp a big band for you? Uh, yeah, pretty big. I mean, going back to the Trigger Happy thing, I remember when Babies was on that, and um, I just, yeah, I, I think Jarvis is another one like Nick Cave. Really, just embodies the showmanship and creativity of it all and um i think that you know his lyrics and coming from the it's like a lot of his albums seem to be like art it, it's coming from the art side of things That's and the right. art pro, art school and everything like that and um, just creating stuff having a go you hear so many stories of like pulp doing gigs in halls of four people when they were just starting off but giving it absolutely everything and then those yeah. four people going away and saying, oh my God, have you seen this band? Instead of them being annoyed that there was four people there, you know? Mm. And um, I just love that song, Fat Children. And I feel like there's, again, there's humor in it and playfulness in it. And uh, it's just like a breath of fresh air, really. And it was once when I was looking, I used to do this thing called the Poetry Takeaway, where it's still going, there's a burger van and uh, they stripped it out and um, put some seats in it and a writing kind of plank. And then you just they just set it up in London, like on the South Bank or outside the... Um, we did it one day and we were outside the Tate Britain Art Gallery. And uh, we were there and people would come up. People come up to the poetry takeaway and say, what's this? And then you say, oh, well... Um, it's a poetry takeaway, so if you give us a, uh, a theme for a poem, or if, you, if you've got someone's birthday coming up, and you give us as much information as you can, then we'll write a, we'll write a poem for you. And um, it turned out that uh, Jarvis was at the Tate Britain when we were when we were doing it there, and he came up to the van, and um, someone else wrote a poem for him. But I said to him, "Oh, I've got this CD." of um because i'd recorded some of my poems or whatever that on just on a cd on garage band and i gave them to him and he was like all oh, right and then um he played one of the tracks on his six music show wow and, and then since, so since then i was like he's a bit of a hero really. it was before that but that just kind of solidified it and then their secret set at glastonbury in the park stage was it that weekend when Radiohead did one that time as yeah. well and um yeah just incredible really but I love the storytelling in that song so it's like so I died in the back of a cab but I'll be back to haunt them now my spirit walks the streets of Tottenham I just love the idea of like Jarvis's ghost walking around Tottenham and yeah. being able to put images in people's heads that aren't already there that's what I'm all about, really. And that's what I love talking about that. And I love creating things. And he, the right, the words that he puts together and that album he did with Chili Gonzalez uh, with the hotel. And just, it's just, just amazing. I remember being on a train after a tough gig in Glasgow, listening to that album. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just the best side of life for me. 
the people who are making stuff. I know that pe people like different aspects of life. Some people like gardening. Some people like making money. But for me, seeing what other people create and come up with is just yeah. dynamite. I love it. Did you see the recent documentary that you see, they, they put it on um, uh, on Amazon Prime, I think, or, or Netflix recently? I just watched it again since you know, <laughs> you know, being in lockdown. Um, the, the, the story of common people is a fucking great documentary, and he goes uh, back to St Martin's College and stuff, and uh, and uh, it's, it's fantastic, and and. And I mean, I, I've I've said it before on this podcast. I, I don't think there's been a better pop star in the UK since Jarvis Cocker. I think he's the perfect pop star. I think he was mm. everything you should want. He's the underdog. He's the artist. He's got wit. You know, he's got charm, and I, I just think he's he's. He's incredible, and 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 what he's also he's a fucking genius and writes incredible records. It's like I, I just don't think there's been a, a more charismatic pop star since Jarvis Cocker. I really don't. And I know that makes me sound like a middle-aged man, and I am. But um, yeah, tell me someone that's been a cooler frontman from the UK since Jarvis Cocker, and I'll argue you. Uh, I don't think there's been one. He's is an absolute dude. No. Yeah. Um, final track, Rob. A song that many may not know that you would like them to hear. This is a track called Bandit by Neil Young that's on the Greendale album, that's a concept album about the devil living in a uh, town. And it's just, um, there's a lyric in it, someday you'll find everything you're looking for. And uh, it's just, I love the detuning of the guitar and the loose strings on it. And um, his, the one of the first music biographies I read was uh, Shaky about Neil Young. And um, yeah, he's just, it's just, I just love that. That whole album is fantastic, but that was a standout track for me on it and um the, i love the how fragile his voice is and uh i like the idea of trying to get to be a mature age and still not have everything figured out you know and just be i don't know he probably has but i, I don't know there's something about his voice that kind of makes me feel very um I like, I don't like it when people are vulnerable, but I like it when they show vulnerable sides, you know, and you feel like you really get into their, what they're really about. And um, that, I don't know, that song seems to embody it for me. Um, yeah. Oh, so perfectly there, Rob. Um, okay, so uh, for the... For the rest of lockdown, um, what are you up to? Podcasting? Yeah, podcasting. Um, I've got to write all of... I've got a... So I'm doing a daily podcast and it's um, me reading out all the writing that I've done that I like enough to want to share with people, really. And um, so I'm, I've, we've got June done and I've got to uh, write, write all of... Uh, july's and uh we got a ps4 about a week ago so i am currently playing a lot of grand theft auto 5 <laughs> and it is blowing my mind <laughs> i just and then, i cannot believe it and when we get out of lockdown um reset you <laughs> to the dates oh. yeah um rescheduled tour dates i've got yeah i mean supposedly october I don't know if that's happening. Hopefully. I hope so. I hope so. I'm doing it with music. I, I was lucky enough to support the Lovely Eggs on a couple of their UK tours. Uh, I think it wasn't last year, the year before. And they're doing their latest album. I should have. Their songs, I love them as a band and their latest album is fantastic. And they're doing a big gig at, they're doing The Garage in Manchester and then heaven in London. It'll be their biggest London show. And then I'm I'm gonna do a 
half hour support slot nice. for them. And but supporting, I mean, that was a mission supporting them. The, the good gigs were brilliant, but the, the tough gigs were really tough because I'm used to people sitting down and they're all standing yeah. up because it's music. And I mean, we did like Bristol, I love Bristol, it's probably my favorite place to gig, really. And um, we did, I think we did it at the Fleece in Bristol. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, just just love it. But it is like combat going up when people are there for music and then you're there and you're doing some yeah. um, comedy or whatever. It takes it takes a bit of winning round. But the, that, I think like the wrestle of it is, I love that. I love the challenge of it. And um, it's really what I'm worried about is that uh, even talking to you today has made me realize, because I used to, um, when we were all in, when it was all guns blazing and I was like promoting the tour and stuff, you get used to being on, well, not used to, I haven't done that many podcasts, but you do, you get, you, your brain gets in the, in the right, in the right space to be able sure. to, for you to be a coherent person. <laughs> and um, you feel like you're in, um, you've, you, you, like you're on it and you match fit for, for talking to people and being a person. And uh, I feel like I'm completely out of practice when, uh, and it's going to take, uh, you know, with people driving, people are going to have to get used to driving again. And I, since I started doing gigs in 2007, I never really had more than a month where a, maybe like a period of a Christmas where I won't, I won't do a gig. And that was when I was just starting off. Um, so weird you say that, Rob. It's like, because um, one of the first ever podcasts I've done, I, 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 um, I had um, Brett Goldstein on as a guest. Mm. And, and and Brett had been out in America and uh, doing do, doing something uh, film based I think and and he said oh yeah like, and, and every evening I'd do stand up and I was like all oh, right I said like um what what just to kind of earn a few quid he went no 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 to to, to stay match fit yeah and and he said you know I, I have to otherwise you know I look at it like going you know to the gym and and you know keeping keeping on top of it and. So it's interesting that you you know that, that you've just said that because this is I guess it makes sense and and, and I think the first podcast I done after maybe I didn't record anything for a, a month and I was I was doing sort of like three or four a week um, face to face and then you know I was recording some bits and bobs on my own sitting down in my little studio but the first one I done uh, of this podcast like over Zoom was very strange it was like I hadn't done anything for a month and I was so used to kind of where you know controlling the conversation and sort of camera right, we're going to ask this question at this point and and you know and start sort of uh, have my flow and and it was it just all was completely undone and it was like right okay right, I've got to start again there and definitely it's good yeah. it's a challenge you know and and yeah. do, you know, do you know what I mean yeah hundred percent it is and it is it's, it's even the thing when you're going out or, or like you're talking to your mates and you go to the pub it's like. I don't always have to think about what I'm going to talk about, but it's like the art of conversation. And um, that's a, it's a thing of going like, okay. And it's, it's just the brain. If you, yeah. it's a muscle, isn't it? So if you stop, if you stop using the connectors that go from your brain to where your words come out and it's sure. like, uh, okay, well, I, I could do this one. So, so, and it's exactly the same of being on stage. That's one of the most the best thing about Edinburgh Festival for me is that you're on stage once, twice, three times a day. Yeah. And it's, you know, and then you come out of it and you've got these new muscles of performance muscles, creativity, um, you're braver than when you started and you're more self-assured. And, and then, I've been doing that every year since 2000. Well, I did 2009, 2011, 2012, and then all the years up to now. And then that's not there this year. And I'm just yeah. like, whoa, I've got to, I've somehow, but I'm, I've started writing, a, I'm doing like a, getting a book together. That's what I'm doing at oh, the amazing. moment. And uh, writing that and i um, going to try and um, just make the most of, not having to travel around. And it's funny that you said that about working smarter. When I was doing advertising, someone said to me, work smarter, don't work harder. 
And I always kind of thought, well, what's he mean by that? And he probably means, yeah, don't travel 15 minutes to do a unpaid set on a Tuesday night when there's four people there. Yeah. Um, but even then, you know, you never know. You might. You, that was the thing. I, I always think, just do it. Well, and, and that, that's that's the that's the argument I have in my head because you know always whether it was in you know when I was in bands or whether I've been promoting or podcasting. It's like when you work for yourself, I guess. It's really, you know, when, when a gig comes up or anything like that, it's like, I, I, you know, you see it as an opportunity and it's like, and I think when you work for yourself, it's really hard to kind of say no to things sometimes because you just think, well, you never know what might come of that. And so they're the things that like, I just find that I may have learned I could change in, in this lockdown. You know, I could maybe just do that as we're doing this, just you know, to a Zoom call, but, you know, yeah. I, 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 but I do also put, I do put value on, on you know, sitting opposite someone and, and you know, being able to kind of feel what's, you know, the the, the, the room out a little bit and, and, and kind of be able to gauge people a little bit. You, do you know what I'm saying? You, you know, obviously when you're in a room with someone, it's very different to, to doing what we're doing here. Yeah, 100%. But, no, there's um, it, it, it must go back to the way that we're wired up. Yeah. Because we've been in this situation for, you know, evolving for thousands and thousands of years for being around people and the sure. energy. It's about the energy. Yeah. You can't, you know, on Zoom, there's like, in on, on chat rooms, it's like, there's no presence. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I, that's my personal um, no, I opinion totally on agree. it. I totally it's agree. Like, it's, it's tough. Because normally I go into a room and I dominate it. Not. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it's, um, it's, uh, <laughs> But are you the quiet thing? guy in the corner with a three pints of water just nah, sitting there not chugging really. away? <laughs> no, I mean, WhatsApp group chat. So the WhatsApp group chat, what's that? Kate Tempest, WhatsApp group chat. Um, but she, uh, that is like, my, my anxiety is goes nuclear in WhatsApp because every time I say something, the conversation just stops. And I'm like, oh God, why did I bother? Um... <laughs> So oh, it's, you know, the, the anxiety attached to WhatsApp is, you know, and and I find we've been doing a lot of quizzes on Zoom and stuff like that. And the, the problem I have with Zoom conversations is if there's more, if there's like six people, if one person's talking, you've got to listen to them. And yeah. it's like, if you go to a pub and one person's talking, it's very rarely that five people will listen to one person. It's yeah. like normally like uh, three groups of two or two groups of three and then you can, I don't know, it's like someone holding court for that. It's like, yeah, it's difficult, isn't it? But, you know, it's a situation we're in and I don't know what's going to happen. And it's, it's so so unpredictable. And um, I just, I feel like it would have been an easier situation if I was a conservative voting um, person who loved the government. And you were like, yes, great. That would be mm. so good. Yeah. Hopefully, a lot of them people are now scratching their heads, thinking, "Why the fucking hell did I vote for them?" Maybe, yeah. <laughs> I hope but, so. Yeah. Rob, so where can people find out about what you're up to? Um, I've got a website, robawson.co.uk, um, and I've got uh, podcast, uh, the Rob Orton Daily Podcast. They're only short; they range from about two to I think the longest one's about seven or eight minutes. That is at Rob Orton, A-U-T-O-N, on Instagram and Twitter. Um, that's it. I'm on Twitter and all that malarkey. And, well, if uh, you saw up with you, I'll tag you in um, all the bits and pieces when we put this episode out so people um, that might not have seen your, your stuff before can go and check it out. Yeah, great. And thanks loads, mate. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. You must be breaking your neck for a piss, man. Yeah, I am. <laughs> 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 Thanks loads, Rob. Yeah, cheers, Joe. Oh, thanks, mate. Was that okay? Yeah, that's great, man.